Thank you very much for that introduction, Katrine, and thank you for inviting me to this meeting and for all of you attending today. And thanks to Pat for uh, setting up a great um, start to this next talk, which will expand or add to some of the examples that Pat talked about. So um, I'll be speaking to you about expanding our view of social housing um, for animals to include us people to consider a broader social community environment uh, where research animals and humans uh, work together. Um, perhaps where the better life of animals is strongly linked to humans and their caretakers and those working with them as researchers, um, ultimately with also improving the lives of people. Uh, I'm just going to add two collaborators. I hadn't originally included them, but as I was preparing the talk, I realized I needed to have them because uh, a lot of the things I'm talking to you about today are things that we've been working on. Oops. Um, what's happened? Okay. Oh dear. Let me just make sure that's in well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Joanna Makowska on the left. Um, Joanna Makowska is uh, adjunct professor in the Animal Welfare Program and also works for the Animal Welfare Institute. And Dr. Dan uh, Weary, uh, professor from the Animal Welfare Program. So um, providing scientific evidence of sentience um, may be enough for some species, such as the vervet monkey on the right, to spur changes in attitudes uh, and behaviors towards animals. For rodents like mice and rats, however, um, there exists a vast amount of scientific evidence for their um, cognitive and emotional complexities, but this evidence seems to be translated poorly into, um, ad in terms of attitudinal and behavioral um, changes among those responsible for their care. And in this presentation, I'll be presenting a bunch of examples around relationships, um, training methods, housing, etc., for research animals uh, intended to provide those responsible with their care with immediate and direct um, evidence of their sentience. Um, we will argue that um, providing people with that uh, immediate and uh, witness to the animal sentience is um, firsthand helps motivate changes uh, in, in the way that animals are cared for. So why are we concerned about that? Um, <clears throat> well, we believe that people matter, people matter a lot. Um, a key element to achieving good animal welfare is a caring, having caring people who work. Uh, with animals. Within laboratory anim uh, environments, animals are often cared for in dispersed locations by a whole variety of people, and we really rely on those individuals to care for their animals well. Um, in addition, um, in terms of improving, um, implementing welfare improvements, uh, it also requires having people who are motivated to make those changes. So we know a lot about improving the lives of research animals now, currently, already. We know a lot about the importance of social housing. We know a lot about how social imp housing impacts uh, data, and if you fail to acknowledge that, uh, how it might impact your data. Um, but it's very difficult to implement changes uh, without the leadership of people. As Pat said, from within, I think we would agree that's very important. So attitudes of people are extremely important for safeguarding animal welfare. And let me illustrate with an example. Recently, uh, this was in the Canadian uh, press. There were two uh, ice fishermen in uh, northwest, in northern Saskatchewan in Wildness Lake. They were at the end of their day. Uh, they'd had their full catch of fish. Uh, and they were leaving, and they came across this um, large head that was in the water um, of a moose. Um, and Reggie Jackson and Nolan were the two fishermen. And Reggie saw the, the animal initially. And he, he, he realized that the, the moose was exhausted, probably from fruitless struggle to get out of this uh, hole in the ice. She was stuck. So the two fishermen worked tirelessly. They, they took their um, chainsaws, they cut water, they uh, placed uh, straps on the hooves of the moose, and they managed to pull her out. The amazing part of the story is listening to how Reggie talks about how that experience influenced him and how it changed him. And he doesn't know that he, if he could ever hunt moose again. So um, Reggie said, it's OK, honey, we'll get you out here. Um, <clears throat> and he also said, she got up, looked us straight in the eye. I don't know. It's almost as if she was thankful, like she appreciated what we did. It's weird to say. It's a feeling we both felt. 
She chilled there for five minutes and trotted off, and that was that. I've hunted moose all the time, but this scenario and perspective has given me a different view. It's hard to explain. It's a good feeling, a really good feeling, locking eyes on her and being so close to her. It changed my perspective for sure. <clears throat> um, as much as uh, Reggie likes eating uh, moose meat, he also wasn't sure whether he could eat it again. Um, it, so this one intimate, direct experience with this individual animal, perhaps this sharing this uh, struggle together, had a huge impact on Reggie. So we believe these types of experiences are, are important for changing attitudes. And there are reasons why this is the case. Um, concepts such as uh, empathy, uh, for example, are, in, in, are important for, for why this may be the case. Empathy is a concept that, um, it is, as we all know, it establishes concern and connection with another being, in this case, animals. It directs our interest and understanding of what is going on with that other being. And it makes someone want to refrain from hurting and instead helping. So lack of empathy then would mean uh, you're less interested in the situation of others and how we affect them. Another uh, closely related concept from psychology on attitudes towards animals is uh, belief in animal mind. And it, in research has revealed that people's support for certain types of species in research is strongly affected by whether you have belief in animal mind, whether you believe that animals have mental capacity capabilities that, such as intellect and reasoning, whether they experience a range of emotions. People who believe in animal mind are more concerned about animal welfare, they behave more humanely towards animals, and they have more empathy to both animals and humans. So it seems reasonable to think then that the research community uh, would benefit or needs people who believe in animal mind with empathy. Um, so, and I'll, so I'll briefly descri uh, describe a study, I talked about it on OLA when, webinar not too long ago, but I'll go over it a little bit, that tried to, uh, intentionally tried to influence um, those working with animals in particular researchers. The goal of the study was to sort of capitalize on features important to empathy and belief in animal mind, to test if exposure to well-socialized rats that demonstrate complex mental and behavioral capabilities increases empathy of those working with research animals. The idea is that if the students in the class see these cool, what we call superstar rats, perform, they'll go back to their labs and they'll just be a little more attentive to their animals and they'll think differently about them. So we designed an educational intervention around this. It was as part of um, mandatory animal training course, the introduction to working with rodents at, at the University of British Columbia. Um, so students either saw the intervention or uh, control rats. And so the intervention in included observing these seven, what we call superstar rats, highly trained rats perform. And the intervention tried to use things that are, are important for uh, in, um, influencing empathetic feelings. So we tried to encourage feelings towards the rat with, by witnessing personalities, the relationship of the rats with us, the handlers. Uh, feelings of compassion motivate us to direct our attention to others. We try to provide that direct experience. Again, the more direct, we know that the more direct experience one has with ind individual animals, more likely we are to perceive them as deserving of our compassion. And finally, uh, to, we wanted to increase understanding of mental experiences. This is a, known to help foster empathy if you see animals as more similar than, than different to us. Some, uh, some of the students who were enrolled in the class just saw the regular sort of what we call the control rats that weren't trained, they had a limited amount of socialization. So the study ha was in four phases, uh, socialization training, the intervention, and then fo focus groups. The first two were necessary to, pro to get the rats ready for the final phases, the actual intervention where they saw the rats, and then we followed up with focus groups to ask people about um, to see whether the intervention had any impact on their, on their views. So just a little bit about the, the housing of our rats. Um, we kept them in these uh, large uh, Critter Nation uh, cages with some examples of some of the enrichment that we had. Some of the participants of this workshop would see the rats in this cage. Uh, we, we, uh, we house them under red lighting. As many of you know, rats are nocturnal, active at night, they can't see red. So we thought it would be best for us to work with, an, with the rats in, in their active phase. <clears throat> and um, 
uh, the, uh, the socialization, the first phase was the socialization phase. We got two pregnant uh, rats from Charles River, a Sprague Dolly and a Long Evans rat. And once the pups were born in the first few days, uh, we started to gently handle, let them get used to our smell, being picked up and so on over a gradual process, um, getting them used to us. And then at about four weeks of age, we started clicker training uh, using positive reinforcement training and, and targets. Uh, we found that the rats, uh, the Long Evans rats, were a little bit easier to train ultimately. And, and the females, uh, once the males reached puberty, the females were a little bit more attentive than the males. And so we ended up with a small subset of these seven female rats. So once the rats are ready, here's the day of the intervention. Uh, here's Sarah and Vanessa walking the rats down in this transport box into the room where the intervention would take place. I should say that we did end up training the rats in the regular lighting because that's where they're going to end up for the intervention. Here's just the setup. It was sort of a U-shaped table. We let the rats free roam on the table. We uh, called the rats by their names. We ourselves didn't wear gloves. And when it came time for the students to handle the rats to practice, they handled the superstar rats that they just see perform. In the background, you can sort of see screens. And on those screens was basically um, some of the personalities of the rats and their names um, so the students could see this. So we had Orca, Grandin, Jane, Marie, Amelia, Anne, and Teresa. I'll just give you some examples of what they said. Here's Marie. Marie is 100% food motivated with seller siblings for treats. And these were statements cr uh, created by the people working mostly with the rats. Grandin probably loves to fetch more than any dog. So um, I'll show you a clip of, of a, a shortened clip of some of what the students would see in the class. Uh, following the intervention, I invited the participants to share a pizza lunch with me where we did focus groups and were asked some questions about the impression of the class, um, what, they, uh, what their impressions of the rats were, if they would consider doing anything different in the future. And um, there were 29 participants, um, uh, how many focus groups? Uh, eight focus groups, three controls, five treatments. Uh, and I'll just go through a couple of quotes, I won't do it in thorough, just to illustrate some of the comments from the participants in the class. I will say for sure uh, there was universal amazement and surprise at what they saw in the rats. Um, in contrast, just a quick comment, the controls um, rarely talked about the rats themselves. They focused more on the technical aspects of the class. So um, one researcher said, uh, my dog can't do any of that. Um, <clears> the <throat> participants were amazed at what they were doing. I'm thinking about them differently. We got to see more of what they're capable of and how they act. I have a bit more respect for them. Participants always talked, also talked about their personalities and wanting to get to know the rats. I thought it was funny that they knew and could respond to their names. It made them like they had their own separate little personalities. So when I went to handle the rat, I got, I was, who is this? I wanted to know, which is weird because it's my, in my lab, it's just numbers. There was also mention of a reciprocal and trusting relationship. I, th I think they're really trusting you guys. The relationship is different if you treat them like that. They trust you as well as know you. 
This researcher commented on the novelty of letting rats roam. Um, I have never seen rats be able to just kind of roam around and let them crawl on the table, and they were kind of just sniffing around. I thought it was nicer than having them in each in their individual cages. And finally, uh, participants spoke about their responsibilities as researchers, how easy it is to be, see their animals as, as objects, and witnessing the social interactions was a good reminder for them. So when you're in a lab, it's very easy to get cold sometimes, just seeing them as the object. Their ability to interact with each other and interact with humans, it does show a bit of personality. So it is good to have this reminder. So overall, there was, there was promise that the intervention promoted feelings of empathy and belief in the animal mind, at least in the short term. One of the things that we didn't consider was the impact that this study had on our own volunteers, or people who worked on the study themselves. Uh, and we had uh, um, eight at this time, uh, B. Lee, starting on the left, B. Lee, Joyce, who was a grad student, Vivian, Lara, Naveen, Sarah, myself, and Vanessa. And um, we, uh, these women, um, m most of them were volunteers spending upwards of six hours a week uh, with the rats. Um, and we've had many since interested and some who have continued on um, volunteering. Uh, one of the things we did is we, we sat down with the, vol with the volunteers and asked them um, about their experiences and why they were willing to, to um, spend so much time. So here are some of their impressions. I love that feeling when you first open the door and they, the rats, go crazy in their cages. It's just really a nice feeling. They're very curious, sociable. I didn't realize that they would be so sociable. I expected that they would be more standoffish and less interested in whether or not I existed. After long periods of time working with them, and they want to come jump on your arm, it's nice. You gain the trust of an animal. It's not like just you going, I want to play, go play with you. They are like, I want to play with you. One of the biggest things I think you get from this is really getting to know your rats on a personal level. I know that this is sort of the point of the whole training system, but I don't think you realize the extent of it until it's finally hands-on. And finally, um, uh, here we asked Sarah, uh, that we asked the, the participants, the students, or sorry, the volunteers, um, whether they talked about this with their friends and family or brought them in to visit the rats. And here's an audio clip of what Sarah said. I, even the video that I have of them, doing the video after, I don't know how many people I have shown. <laughs> Just to show them how smart rats are, be like, oh, like, oh, you work with rats, and I'm so happy I found that video. And be like, yeah, like, look at how smart they are, and look at what they can do. So it was uh, quite impactful, and in a sense, the, stu the people working on the project sort of had the intervention um, kind of done to them, in a sense. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow with a few more uh, examples of sort of animal um, relationships in our facility that have uh, this project in a sense has gone on to trigger a few more things. Uh, I'll tell you about the story of Marge. Marge was a miniature Yucatan pig who arrived as a young weanling and you can see her on the left with uh, one of the husbandry staff and on the right one of my colleagues Shelley getting goosed at a later, later age. Um, Marge was intended for diabetes research. Uh, two other pigs joined her a little bit later as Ellen and Bertha. And they had some blood collected, but over time the researchers decided they weren't going to use them anymore. So by this time these pigs had sort of become pets in the facility. Um, this is not uncommon and has been documented in the literature and the anthropology literature for a long time in lab animals. Um, and so um, they were really concerned about what was going to happen with these pigs. They didn't want them to go into invasive study. So I approached the researcher and um, he agreed to adopt the pigs out. And this was new for our institution for larger animals to adopt out. So uh, while waiting for their new home, um, these pigs were quite productive. We used them a lot in enrichment testing. Uh, we did behavior studies looking at free, free range versus um, confined sort of living. Um, we tested out all sorts of training methods, et cetera. So they were pretty, uh, pretty useful pigs. Um, at, when, um, when the researcher agreed to give them, uh, we created a, a card to, to acknowledge our, our appreciation of, of the pigs uh, to that researcher, which was exciting for everybody. And in the end, they all got adopted out, and this is their, their new home. 
And this is a recent email. I, I was contacting the owner, what she said about the pigs. So the three Migos are all great. They are lovely girls. Now it's warmer. They love staying outside all day, just rooting around and sunning themselves. It was colder than usual this winter, and they made short forays out, but spent much time snuggling indoors in their giant nest. They do really enjoy nest building under the heat lamp. They don't much like rain either. More sun lovers. Me too. So um, perhaps uh, 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 these three pigs can be ambassadors uh, for how important and interesting they are, both within the, the institution and outside the institution. And I will say that since that time, um, we have it continued to expand based on the superstar rats and these pigs. More, pre more positive reinforcement training programs. Um, uh, several researchers are letting us use their animals and work with them as part of their research projects. Uh, we continue to test a variety of, of training. Um, as well, even in highly debilitated act, uh, um, in animals. And I will say, that obviously, that the social interaction um, is also important, is a benefit for the animals working with the people as well. Here's just a video of uh, an undergraduate student as part of her practicum study who was training uh, this Duroc pig, Rachel, who's part of a wound healing study to lie down because we needed full access to her abdomen. It was for another study that we were testing it, um, and we didn't want to use sedation. Oops, okay, come on. Oops. Not so keen on sitting up, but oh well, a bit slippery for. So that was Rachel. Uh, here's Petunia, uh, another pig who became a social companion for a pig who'd lost its penmate because of the laryngeal paralysis. She's currently up for adoption, and as I said, this is a new thing for, for UBC, so um, I think this is positive change. These sorts of uh, personalizations and emotional attachments have become more common in our facility. We now have the employee of the month, where Petunia is featured for a month of May. Um, recently, we had a, a veterinary resident who uh, is been, has been spending some time as part of a residency program uh, in the facility, and she was hanging out with the pigs one day. And it was interesting listening to her talk about that. She said, how cool is that, just getting to hang out with pigs? Who ever gets to do that? Claudia also said that I found it just great to sit with the two pigs, watching them eat and forage the entire time. I also found it interesting to see how they interact with each other, responded to social stress and how they interacted with people. When you watch them for just a few minutes, you don't usually get to see just how much time they spend foraging, moving around, or sleeping. I did feel more connected to them after that time spent with them. And as, as Pat mentioned, uh, these sorts of relationships um, are likely to induce more emotional attachments uh, with, with staff which is, and, and researchers, which is potentially challenging. And, and participants in my superstar study also commented on that, and we talked a lot about that. However, I, I do think these things can also be celebrated. And for example, Short Jaw, um, he was, um, had an underbite, um, was a long-term pig. Uh, a pig, long-term sheep, in a longer-term study, so a lot of people knew him. When it came time for euthanizing short jaw, we had a short jaw cupcake day, which was quite well received. Bonds form with all sorts of other animals. Here's Micromouse and friends, and Micromouse is sitting on top of the shoulder of this lab tech, and, and she would, she initiated a playpen situation where this cage of mice would end, go into a larger enriched cage every day for, for some enrichment. Uh, Pooh was the mouse I featured at the beginning, who, who was photographed professionally, pretty fancy. And then I'll leave you with a final, uh, very in cool example of Joyce Sato Reinhold, who was a neuroscientist researcher studying jealousy in rats and whether animals, uh, rats can feel, be jealous. And I'll show you a clip of, of uh, Joyce where she's starting her testing day uh, by placing her rat on the top of this uh, large cage and, and, and asking the rat to come and participate in the study. Oops.
So Joyce trained her rats to freely participate in the experiment. They were never food or water to deprived for training. They were given treats at variety, not just for the training for this episode, for a variety of other things, and they still chose to participate in her behavioral testing. Here's just another clip of Joyce um, showing, illustrating a well-socialized rat in her research program. She's sitting with her on her lap, and there is the bat detector. You'll hear the high-frequency chirping, the 50 kilohertz chir chirping in the background, which represents positive uh, emotional states. The ultrasonic uh, vocalizations was just as a bat detector hooked up to a computer, so it was a fairly cheap setup. So in contrast, whoops, in contrast, here's a video of some rats in some standard housing. Um, this was filmed at uh, in the dark hours, so the yellow is uh, because of a low sodium lamp that. Um, and we used. Um, so this is kind of our normal impression of rats in standard housing. So in um, conclusion, um, we think it's important to rethink the, the social environment and to consider things like allowing animals to show off their complexity by housing them in appropriate environments, allowing caregivers to have meaningful positive interactions with animals, allowing animals and their caregivers to be ambassadors, helping to change societal views of, of research animals and focusing on direct experiences and individual narratives uh, between the human-animal relationship. And just to finish off, I'm gonna show you one more video of rats in um, a playpen cage. So Dr. Joanna Mikowska has been doing a study where she's looking at whether temporary access to large and rich cages is a benefit so that they're not in them all the time, can still be in somewhat standard cages. Um, and here's some video clips um, from that work. So uh, finally, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention. Thanks to all the animals and people featured in this presentation and funding from the John Hopkins Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing for the RAT Superstar Study. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. <laughs>